On this episode of G-Week, we cover the aftermath of the food truck that caught fire on campus two weeks ago. Talk to GW students about their reaction to Donald Trump's election as the 45th president of the United States. And get an inside look at the downtown holiday market that's bringing the joy of the season to DC. All this and more on G-Week. Welcome to the latest episode of G-Week. I'm your host, Mary Grace Brown. On election day at 7 a.m., GW's 2017 inaugural ball tickets went on sale for $135 per ticket. The ball follows the official presidential inauguration on January 20th, taking place from 8 p.m. to midnight at the Omni Shoreham Hotel. The event sold out in hours and a Facebook page was created for students to resell tickets. However, when Donald Trump was announced as president-elect, some students responded to his victory by selling their tickets, some for below face value since tickets are non-refundable by GW. The inaugural ball only takes place once every four years, deeming it the ultimate only at GW experience. Following the contentious and unprecedented election and a win for Donald Trump, which surprised many, we sent reporter Rudy Venkatesen to talk to students about their feelings post-election. Thanks, Mary Grace. One month ago, we decided to hit the streets to ask GW students their feelings on the upcoming election. The majority of GW students did, in fact, support Secretary Hillary Clinton. Seeing as how the new president-elect is Donald Trump, we've decided to hit the streets again to ask GW students their feelings on the results and the controversy surrounding the past election. So how do you feel on Donald Trump uh, becoming the new president? I mean, I don't really know, to be quite honest. Because I, I don't know how, how seriously I could take him. Because sometimes he'll say one thing and then he'll say another that kind of contradicts what he said earlier. Donald Trump being the leader of our nation means that there are a significant amount of um, our citizens that condone hate. And that really scares me, to be quite honest. How do you feel about his cabinet appointments? Um, his cabinet appointments have been very impressive to me. Uh, Appointments such as uh, Jeff Sessions, who has an illustrious career in the Senate as a prosecutor in Alabama, um, as well as uh, appointments outside the cabinet, such as uh, National Security Advisor and Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. Um, I've been encouraged by a few of them. Um, I, I'm a fan of uh, General Mattis and Nikki Haley, um, but then other others of them are concerning to me, like Jeff Sessions. Um, I know he's had some uh, rough positions on uh, race relations in the past, and so. Um, uh, he has a few appointments that, that make me hopeful, others that um, I'm a bit worried about. A little bit worried. I'm glad that he picked people that actually like have experience in like politics and in the army and stuff like that, but they obviously don't really align with a lot of my views and like what I think, but hopefully like it still works out and he has people advising him that know what they're talking about. Do you plan on going to the Capitol on Inauguration Day? No, I do not. I... I probably don't even plan on going to the White House. I think that's the thing that um, just as an American I'm really excited to um, to experience an uh, inauguration day even if I didn't vote for um, the president uh, and yeah I'm just I think that's a, a patriotic thing to do. I think it's one of those only at GW things. Exactly yeah it's an only at GW moment and I'm looking forward to it. I think I may go to inauguration day to observe but I don't I will not be celebrating. It seems that GW students have come to terms with the election's results and are hoping that the country will move forward together. For G-Week, I'm Vruti Venkatesan. Thanks, Vruti. A week after Election Day, Senator Bernie Sanders came to GW for his first book tour stop following the 2016 election. The conversation was sponsored by Politics and Prose. Sanders spoke at a sold-out Lisner Auditorium about his time on the campaign trail and outlined his post-election plans. Some lucky audience members even received signed copies of his new book, Our Revolution. The day before Sanders came to campus, some GW students walked out of class in the afternoon and assembled in Cogan Plaza to protest the election of Donald Trump. Here's Eric Robinson with the story. On a Tuesday afternoon, with shouts of Love Trump's Hate and No Justice, No Peace, GW students staged a walkout of class to protest the election of Donald Trump. Those participating wore black to signal to other protesters in class that they would not be walking out alone. The capability of his followers and his potential administration scare me. Event organizers, 
escorted by the campus police department, led students down Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House, where the protest paused. Awesome! The protest then continued through Washington Circle and ended at Rice Hall. There, Student Association Senator Keiko Saboy and Black Student Union Community Service Chair Rebecca Amadi attempted to deliver a list of demands to President Knapp that outlined the changes the groups wanted to see. However, Knapp was unavailable, so the students delivered the message to Chief of Staff Barbara Porter, who said she would pass along the information. The demands included increased funding for the Multicultural Student Services Center and the asserting of the university on the side of students of color, creating a place of sanctuary for undocumented students, workers, and their families, and divestment from the fossil fuel industry. While negotiations occur, protesters remained outside and shared words of encouragement and anecdotes that underlined why representation matters. Reporting for G Week, this is Eric Robinson. Thanks, Eric. We will be back with more news after the break. Stay with us. Wonderful academic institution with a fine athletic tradition. Patricio Garino throws it down with two hands. Wonderful city. It's a great place to go to school. Keith and Savage open down the right side. We'll go and dunk it with his right hand. Not just the family, it's a whole community. Arnwood dunks it with 1.9 seconds left. Arnwood, a thunder slam. 81-80 George Washington. A huge victory for the Colonials. Welcome back. Did you know that 2016 marks the 50th anniversary of GW's last football season? The team was founded in 1881 when GW was known as the Columbian College. In the 1930s, the GW football team rose to its peak and claimed what is now RFK Stadium as its home turf. The Colonials were most successful between the 30s and the 50s when they played other top teams such as the University of Alabama, Bucknell, and the University of Oklahoma. Before the team's decline, Coach Jim Camp won Southern Conference Coach of the Year in 1966. The following year, the Board of Trustees decided to dissolve the program due to low game attendance and high expenses. The last game took place on Thanksgiving Day in 1967. Also on campus, Rolls by You, a new food establishment, has officially opened its doors in the former location of the Fobogro Sandwich Shop, serving highly customizable sushi rolls, bowls, and burritos. This is the company's second location to open in the DMV area. Although many students were disappointed to see the Fobo Gross Sandwich Shop close after ownership changed hands, they'll be excited to learn that Rolls by You is open seven days a week and accepts G-World's payment. Early in November, one of the food trucks parked on campus erupted in flames. We sent reporter Matt Kerwin to get the scoop on the status of the food truck and those injured in the accident. Matt? Thanks, Mary Grace. Earlier this month, one of our beloved resident food trucks, the Falafel Bus, caught on fire. While this was a devastating event, there was comfort in knowing that there were people out there who were willing to help. Three employees were injured during the incident. Thankfully, they are all recovering well. Nearly $10,000 were raised through a GoFundMe started by freshman John Kim. I had a chance to sit with him and talk about the fundraising. My biggest motivation to uh, help the Falafel guy was that um, you know, that guy needs help, you know? Although I do not know that guy, but that guy needs help for sure. Like, with the money, because he lost his business, like, his business literally blew up. I really appreciate that um, all the donors were really um, willing to donate a small portion of their dollars in their wallet. And, um, yeah, they're really, uh, they're really thankful that, um, thankful to everyone who donated. I'm really surprised that so many people care about these people, although they do not know that they do, not know, they do not know those people. Um, it really, uh, you know, restored my faith in humanity because, you know, now these people just care, their, care about themselves, but there are definitely a lot of people who care about others. It's great to see the GW community banding together for the greater good. For G Week, I'm Matt Kerwin. Thanks, Matt. GW President Knapp recently announced that he supports the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program which exempts certain undocumented immigrants from deportation. GW joined more than 180 colleges and universities across the country to ensure that certain foreign students are able to carry out their education. Check out the link below for further information if you think you or a friend might be eligible. This November was Native American Heritage Month, which was created in 1992 under President George H.W. Bush. 
The month acknowledges the significant contributions that Native Americans have made to this country and celebrates their rich and diverse cultures. This year in Washington, D.C., an opening ceremony at the Department of Interior featured keynote speaker Thomas H. Begay. Begay is United States Marine Corps retired World War II Navajo code talker. There are many fun and educational events that Native American tribes, national parks, and museums hosted throughout the month. President Obama declared November 25th to be celebrated as Native American Heritage Day. We'll be right back after the break. Stay tuned. So George's been doing a pretty good job since he started here, huh? Yeah, but I don't think he understands Casual Friday yet. Hey, George. What's up, George? Yeah. So George's been doing a pretty good job. So George's been doing a pretty good job since he started here, huh? Yeah, but I don't think he understands Casual Friday yet. Hey, George. What's up, George? Yeah, real presidential. Welcome back. Looking for an opportunity to wear your ugliest holiday sweater? You can wear it in a festive and athletic way by participating in the Ugly Sweater Run at RFK Stadium on Saturday, December 17th. Join thousands of runners and walkers from around the nation to burn some calories and have some fun in the merriest 5K of the year. The registration fee for the run is $35, which includes a hot chocolate and Kahlua cocktail at the finish line. There is also an opportunity to take a holiday photo at a life-size snow globe in front of a 40-foot tall Santa. It's never too early to get into the holiday spirit. The downtown holiday market opened on November 25th and is bringing seasonal cheer to D.C. Hallie Brown has the story. Christmas is just around the corner and One Winter Wonderland is helping to spread the holiday cheer. D.C.'s downtown holiday market is here for 2016 and it's better than ever. The festive local charm brings the best parts of the holidays to F Street, and with more than 150 vendors, live music, and food, the 2016 holiday market does not disappoint. I think this is like a really good place to shop for family. They had a lot of cool like um, little shops for like mom, like they had chocolate and a lot of different cool um, jewelry and a lot of different things like that. So I think it's a really good like shopping place. USA Today named the market the best holiday festival of 2016, and the Travel Mac has claimed it as one of the top 20 Christmas markets in the United States. It's um, it's just it puts you in the holiday spirit because it's not like necessarily something you would buy for yourself, but it's a good thing to look out for others and to buy for others during the holiday spirit, and you know, just share the love of Christmas and <laughs> all the holidays. <laughs> The holiday market runs until December 23rd and is open daily from noon to 8 p.m. Make sure to check out this one-stop winter wonderland before heading home for the holidays. You won't want to miss it. For G Week, this is Hallie Brown. Thanks, Hallie. Celebrities including Eva Longoria, Chance the Rapper, Kelly Clarkson, and Mark Anthony join the Obama family to light this year's national Christmas tree. The tree is eco-friendly, sporting 300 recycled ornaments, and using LED lights to save over 7,000 pounds of greenhouse gas emissions. This is the 94th year of the National Tree Lighting, a tradition started by former President Calvin Coolidge. Coming up, we sit down with Hannah Root, who plays an influential role in Adopt a Family, a special GW program that helps make the holiday season special for families in need. Nearly 16 million people visit Washington, D.C. every year. Some come to witness, some to be heard. We come to make an impact to learn from leaders, and to lead others, to create, and create change. We are the George Washington University. We come to make history. Welcome back. Adoptive Family is a signature tradition at GW that speaks to the compassion of students and staff who are willing to give back especially during the holiday season. The program allows members of the GW community to adopt families in Washington, D.C. and provide them with holiday gifts. Here with us now is Hannah Root, the Program Planning Assistant for Adopt-A-Family at GW. Welcome to our show. Hi, thanks for having me. Of course. So please tell me more about Adopt-A-Family and the overall goal. Um, so Adopt-A-Family is our annual gift-giving event where we allow 
members of our GW community, be that faculty, staff, students, student orgs, to sponsor families throughout the holiday season and provide them with the gifts that they may need or want. Okay, so what is your specific role? Um, so as a program planning assistant, I work with um, one other person in my office and we plan this event top to bottom. Um, basically, a large part of my role was outreach and recruiting donors and potential donors. Um, that meant recruiting people that had already donated last year or um, reaching out to every single student org on campus and trying to make sure that our impact could be as high as it possibly was. So who is eligible to adopt a family? Are there any requirements you're looking for before you say, okay, you can adopt a family? Um, not entirely. We will pretty much accept our donations from anybody who is willing to give. Um, we have taken donations from individual students, individual professors, all the way up to the Department of State. Um, wow. So the State Department was here this year. They donated. Um, so we are really open to who we will accept gifts from. If you're willing to give, we'll take it. <laughs> So which families qualify for this program? So that is actually not our call. Um, we partnered with six different community partners this year throughout DC, different organizations um, and departments within the DC community um, that we then just, we give them the full rights to choose who they would like to give the gifts to. Um, they send us a list, we're not a part of that process, it remains anonymous to us. Now can you tell me how the entire process works from start to finish. Yeah, so um, first thing was communicating with our community partners, um, getting those partners squared away, solidified um, who we were gonna be working with for the year. And then we tell them, um, please have a list of so many names for us by this deadline. And then during that time in between then and that deadline, we do our recruiting efforts, putting up posters, sending out emails, um, sending out a lot of emails basically. <laughs> yeah, um, I bet that's your job. A that, lot of emails, yeah. that was my job. Um, researching who are the student work presidents, who are the presidents and heads of all of the Greek life chapters on this campus. Um, really trying to figure out who we can connect to in every way, shape, and form. Um, and then we have the registration for that. People tell us how many individuals they are willing to adopt or can adopt. Um, and then after both of those deadlines are met, we pair people up and then send it out. And then as we had the other day, we have our drop off and our pickup. Got it. Where exactly is that? That's in the Marvin Center. We do everything in the Grand Ballroom. Okay. Good to know. At GW should probably do it next year. I think that would be a great idea. Yeah. We are <laughs> student org. Um, so how many families participated in the program this year? I am not sure about the exact number of families, um, but we did have almost 500 individuals. We do it um, individual based. Some of our community partners don't even tell us who is a family exactly, um, but I do know that we had almost 500 individuals this year. Got it. Do you personally have any uplifting stories from working with this program? Um, it's interesting because I don't, I don't do a whole lot of interaction until the days of where we have drop off and pick up because I'm behind the scenes a lot of the time. Um, but I just think that the feelings that you get when the community partners come to pick up where we in our heads a lot of the time we think like, oh, I didn't do this right, I didn't do this right. Um, where the community partners are there and they are just so grateful and so thankful. Um, it really puts it into perspective for you where maybe on our end we see numbers and names and stuff like that, but these people know everybody that the gifts are going to be going to and so their reactions are really important to me to keep it in perspective where these are real people that these gifts are going to and I think that that is just so heartwarming to me to meet the people who are actually genuinely involved in those communities. Right so going off that what is the most worthwhile part of this for you? I'm sure it probably comes comes along with that that you're helping others. Yeah, um, so for me, I just love the impact that this can have on the DC community and the way that this connects the GW community to the DC community because a lot of times we get stuck here, we're on campus, we're on Foggy Bottom and we stay here. Um, a lot of the, press, the professors come here and then they go back home. Um, so I think that this gives us a sense of place in the city and I think that this gives us a sense of responsibility in the city where it's not just us on this campus but we are part of a larger community and that's what makes it worthwhile to me is that we're doing that outreach and
being an active part of DC. Absolutely. What made you want to get involved with Adopt-A-Family? <laughs> it's my job. <laughs> so I was hired as a program planning assistant and I was put on the Adopt-A-Family um, assignment. So it was not so much a matter of choice, definitely, but I do know that what I applied to this job for was to be able to plan these types of events. I love event planning. I love event planning in terms of community service um, and that kind of outreach and connecting our campus to DC. So that's why I applied for the job in general. So, Can you tell me about some of the gifts that you are seeing? Just give examples. Oh gosh, there are so many like just fun, fun gifts that we see. Um, there were a couple of bikes this year, which was Ooh. great. Um, <laughs> But it's also really great to see that there are useful things where our gifts are each broken down into three separate gifts um, where we have household or educational items, um, a shoe or clothing item, and then a fun gift request. And so we don't only partner with children, but we partner with their parents often too. And um, seeing things like microwaves, dishes, pots and pans, like the absolute necessities that I think we all kind of take for granted sometimes. Um, it was really great to see that those needs could be filled in the same way that, you know, if they wanted a gift card or a toy or a bathrobe or something like that, right. like those needs could also be met. Right, and then just finally, tell me about this year's outcome. Was it pretty successful? We were successful. Um, I was kind of in my head with the numbers and stuff like that, and then on the day of, um, as I said, you see the community partners and they're just thrilled and overwhelmed by what we were able to do this year and we set our limit a little bit higher than <laughs> we had expected to or we had in years past and we still had a very high adoption rate so it was great. Really good to know. Well thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. We will be right back with more headlines after the commercial break. Stay with us. It's on us. To stand up to those who tell us it's not our business. To tell our friends if what they're doing is wrong. It's on us. To do something anything to keep an assault from happening. To be more than a bystander. To create an environment where women feel and are safe. It's on us to change the way we talk about women. To be part of the solution, not part of the problem. It's on us. To say something when our friends are being stupid. To hold our friends accountable for their actions. It's on us to, to look, look out, out for, for someone, someone who's had, who's too, had much too much to drink. To drink to step in if a friend is doing something that could lead to sexual assault. It's on us. To not give our friends a pass. To never blame the victim. To stop a sexual assault any way we can. I am a member of the George Washington University community, and it's on us to end sexual violence. Welcome back. President Obama recently made the decision to appoint the Dean of the Elliott School, Reuben Brigady, to the National Security Education Board which provides training for people who work in national security. Brigady will serve as an advisor to the board. Brigady has been well received by Elliott School students in his brief time with the university and will be keeping his position as dean during his time with the NSC. GW's Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week took place last month. The campaign used the hashtag KnowYourNeighbor to highlight the lives of those who are homeless and are living near campus. With the colder weather approaching, the homeless population has been a concern for D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, who wants the homeless in D.C. to get the help they need. The mayor is trying to enact a bill to make it easier for members of the homeless population in D.C. to seek shelter options within the city. However, this bill is receiving criticism from the D.C. Council and will not be pursued by the council before January. The GW Alternative Breaks program held its annual fall ball in early November to fundraise for its upcoming winter and spring break trips. The trips aim to strengthen interactions in the global community through service and education. The money collected from the ticket sales helps support students doing community service in various locations in the United States and Latin America. That brings us to the end of our show. Until next time, make sure to check out GWTV on our website at www.gw-tv.com. Thanks for tuning in, GW. We'll be seeing you after the holidays. Have a safe and happy winter break, Colonials.